Where the fuck is my wallet? What the fuck? Come on, I know you've got my wallet. Just, just give me the wallet. Those are the words of someone who does not know the true despair of defeat. You know what, you can keep the fucking wallet. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name's Oliver. You know, they invited a bunch of YouTubers to go to Japan to play this game early. But you know, I mean, hello, you forgot about me, biggest YouTuber on the planet. What's going on guys? I mean, I'll gladly go to Japan to play again. Video games nowadays are creatively dying. We asked for bigger and better games, but yet didn't really understand the consequences of it. Gaming is the number one source of entertainment in the entire world. Nothing sells more than video games. The result of this is now companies don't want to take any risks. I mean, why would you? You poured millions of dollars into it, so you're always going to go with the algorithm. Stuff you know is going to make money. That's why we have franchises like Far Cry, which should have ended years ago. It's because it's easy to do. EA famously once said single player games are dead, to which everyone laughed at them and said, Haha, look at God of War. But what you failed to realise was they were right. Why spend five years working very hard to make God of War when you can make two multiplayer games a year and continuously monetize them? It's going to make way more money. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad games like God of War exist. It shows me some people still care. What I'm saying is those games are incredibly rare because no one's willing to risk it. The bottom line is, most games today suck because now money is the most important thing. These are not well-designed passion projects, they're products. This is why we have to rely off indie developers who basically don't have any money, or the very few AAA companies that are still left that make good games. One of those studios being From Software. Now to say I'm a fan of From Software is an understatement. Bloodborne is probably my favourite game of all time, it is top to bottom a fucking masterpiece. Miyazaki is a genius. Not not that Miyazaki, but he's also a genius. So after Dark Souls 3, which I liked a lot, Miyazaki did the impossible. He said he's fed up with the Souls series and wanted to make something else. This is unheard of in the AAA industry. You don't end a franchise, you just keep going. So then everyone freaked out and said, Oh god, what's he gonna do next? Battle Royale? No, instead what he came back with was something quite different. He came back with Sekiro, Oliver Dies, more than twice. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the best game I've played in the last five years. It is absolutely brilliant in basically every single way. It's fast, it's fun, it's really, really hard. I mean, it makes Bloodborne look like a joke. What the hell, Miyazaki? You know, one of my complaints about Dark Souls 3 is that it was too easy, and now Miyazaki's gone and done this. It's like he's, he's done it just to piss me off or something. For those of you worried about spoilers, I'm only going to be showing the first area of the game, since these games are better off not knowing anything about them. Also, as much as you don't want me to compare it to Dark Souls, I kind of have no choice, because they're basically the same genre. <laughs> Now, comparing Sekiro presentation-wise to Dark Souls and Bloodborne is a little unfair. Those games had these giant epic-looking fantasy worlds which allowed them to get away with whatever location they wanted to make. Sekiro is a lot more realistic-looking and very dedicated to capturing the look of the Sengoku era. They've done a fantastic job as always, but what I'm saying is, sure the dark graphic streets of Yarnum are much more interesting, but it's not fair to compare the two. Sekiro graphically isn't phenomenal, but in terms of design it's wonderful. The atmosphere and tone is perfect, the game looks like a painting. Some of the vast open areas are jaw-dropping, I don't even want to know how much time and effort went into making every area look so incredible. Thanks to minimal loading screens, these games always feel like worlds and it makes exploring every inch of it interesting as you're constantly wondering, hey what weird shit am I gonna see next? The level design is top-notch, every area is distinctive so you never get lost. The different environments in the game all tell their own stories visually. One area the buildings will be on fire and soldiers will be fighting each other, another will be covered in mist with a feeling of dread in the air like there's some sort of curse surrounding it. Some of the enemy designs are amazing, from guys in giant armour to all sorts of horrible monsters. All the textures have so much work put into them. There isn't really an area that looks worse than another, this is the same for the lighting. Sound design is phenomenal, the sound of swords clashing never gets old and neither does the sound of you dying for the 200th time. The soundtrack is once again just the best thing ever. Bloodborne is the holy grail of video game soundtracks and it carries on into Sekiro. 
They went for music that fits the time period, and they have nailed it, it certainly fits the Sengoku era. When sneaking around you'll have this slow sinister violin playing, and in those bigger fights the music gets a bit faster and more epic. Obviously it's unfair to compare it to the Souls soundtracks which had these epic orchestras with choirs that made you feel like this. <laughs> But Sekiro's soundtrack is still brilliant. In the closing years of the Sengoku era, Japan was consumed by a perpetual conflict. The fires Unlike the Soul series, Sekiro actually has a proper clear story. The previous games did have a story, but it was fairly vague and difficult to follow if you didn't know anything about the game. But to make up for that, the lore and the world is fantastically put together. Except Dark Souls 2, but we don't talk about Dark Souls 2. You could spend hours reading item descriptions or listening to all the cryptic dialogue from the characters in the game to help piece together the world. Sekiro also has this, but this time around it feels like From have actually finally figured out how to tell a concise story. Now, story isn't the main focus of these games. I mean, the first time I finished Dark Souls I couldn't tell you what it's about, but if you do bother to try and figure out what's going on, it becomes much more interesting. The big change this time around is that you play as an actual character simply known as the One-Armed Wolf. Yes, this means there is no character creation in this game. Wait, 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 wait. Before you start getting angry because you can no longer roleplay as Shrek Master 64, this is actually better for this game. In the Souls series, you weren't a character. You were supposed to be just some guy, so character creation was an obvious thing to do. In Sekiro, you are the heart of the story. It's more the world interacting with you than you interacting with the world. It's not the best narrative, but that's not what these games are about, and it works for what it is. What does matter, however, is the world, and thankfully, Sekiro's is pretty awesome. If you've ever played Neo, then you can draw a lot of similarities between the two. Sekiro, however, is set in the middle of the Sengoku era, whereas Neo is based more around the beginning of Edo. Sekiro, like Neo, captures this pretty damn well, except there are also horrible monsters roaming around that will not hesitate to kill you in all sorts of terrible ways. They've really captured this place of hate and war. Much like the Dark Souls games, there isn't a place you feel safe. Everything is constantly trying to kill you, there is no place to stop and have a picnic. Look, you're not going to get a world as rich as Dark Souls or Bloodborne. Bloodborne has my favourite world in any game. I love gothic horror, but I'm not judging this as a Souls game. I'm judging it as its own thing, as you should too, because Sekiro is... quite, quite different. Every fight in this game feels like a war. Mechanically, Sekiro is the best game from software I've ever made. They've once again nailed that easy to learn but hard to master gameplay from their previous games. Except for this one is really hard. Like did I mention how difficult it is? The main reason for Sekiro's difficulty is because it's different, but it still feels like you're playing Dark Souls. Your first Souls game tends to be your hardest because there's that learning curve you have to get over. Sekiro takes everything you've learnt from Dark Souls and throws it out the window. Also due to the combat being a little bit more complex, that learning curve is twice the size. That being said, Sekiro has the best melee combat system I've ever seen in the game. First though, before I talk about Sekiro's combat, let's talk about how to design a melee combat system. Also keep in mind the Soul series has the best one yet. You have two options when you design a melee combat system. Well, really three, but I wouldn't recommend the third one to anyone. The third one being what I like to call Minecraft combat where you just spam left click. It's one of the reasons I don't like Dying Light. You could also do what Kingdom Come Deliverance did, but uh, uh, Anyway, the first option is the Batman Free Flow Combat. This usually involves taking on large groups of enemies where you'll focus on building combos and using a lot of button combinations and gadgets. You can see this adopted in games like Mad Max and slight variations of it in games such as Devil May Cry. Yes, I know Batman didn't invent it, but it's the best one. Then you have the second option where you base your combat system more off the enemies than the player. Dark Souls does not have a complex combat system. You swing and roll out the way, that's about 90% of the gameplay. You yourself do not have a lot of methods of attack, but your enemies can vary hugely. The reason the game is so good and so hard, but yet is so simple is because the whole game is you learning how not to die by understanding attack patterns and what to do in certain situations. A lot of people said God of War was just copying Dark Souls, to which you're correct, because it's the best way to do it. So if that system is so good, why isn't it that common? Well that's because it's really hard to design, that's why you should appreciate just how great those games are. Sekiro adopts this same system but alters it, it's now a lot more than just attack and dodge. Sekiro at its heart is a sword fighting game. Your main method of offense and defense is deflecting enemy attacks by pressing the left bumper. If you were one of those people who didn't learn how to parry in Dark Souls, then oh boy you're fucked. It's more forgiving than the parry in Dark Souls, but it's still the core of Sekiro's gameplay. 
When you attack an enemy, their posture bar will show up. The more you deflect and attack your opponent, that bar will fill up. Once full, you'll break the opponent's posture, allowing you to deal a killing blow, which is, by the way, one of the most satisfying things you can ever experience, and it does not get old. You also don't have a stamina meter, meaning you can dodge and attack as much as you want and you won't get tired. So then you think, oh wow, why don't I just wail on the enemy until it dies? <laughs> Are you naive son of a bitch, you think it's that easy? I wish it was that easy. These rules don't only apply to the enemies, but you as well. At the bottom of the screen, you also have your own posture bar. The enemies can also deflect your attacks and break your posture, leaving you open to whatever attack they deal out next, and if you're facing a tough opponent, most likely you'll just die. This turns the combat into this beautiful game of cat and mouse. This makes attacking and deflecting at the right time crucial, and trust me, one wrong move often ends in death. You can see why the game is difficult now. Deflecting requires perfect timing, and some enemies make that quite difficult to accomplish! Block too late and you'll get hit, block too soon and all you'll do is take posture damage. Yes Dark Souls players, blocking is a bad idea. Not only that, but dodging has no invincibility frames. If you dodge into that sword, you're going to get hit. Oh, that's okay, I'll just summon some people in to help distract the enemy. Too bad, this game is single player only. There is no sun god for you now. Also, by the way, most enemies in the game have a bigger posture bar than you, meaning they can fuck up about 70 times, whereas if you fuck up twice, you die. But that's not all. Enemies can also do undeflectable attacks. This is usually a grab that'll kill you in one hit, or some other attack that will probably kill you in one hit. However, there is a red symbol that appears telling you the enemy is about to do one of these attacks, but it only lasts about a millisecond. This basically means you have to dodge or jump out of the way, which may I remind you, all of this is happening within a second, meaning you have to react to this immediately. And if you dodge when you're supposed to jump, you'll die. And if you jump when you're supposed to dodge, you'll probably die. And that's all assuming you didn't just block out of instinct. Oh, also you'll most likely have to fight more than one of these enemies at the same time, and if you don't attack an enemy for long enough, they'll regain their posture bar. It's fucking hard, is what I'm saying. But that variation in enemy types is what makes the game feel so damn refreshing. There is always a new challenge to overcome and new strategies to develop. Of course, enemies also have a health bar, which you could just very slowly chip away at. But not only is that very slow, but it's also incredibly dangerous. So right, you're thinking... Oliver, this sounds impossible. Well hold on there friend, Mongolia wasn't built in a day. There are many small mechanics in Sekiro that are all crucial to mastering if you want to be the ultimate shinobi. One of those mechanics being stealth. This is a spiritual successor to the Tenchu series after all. Sneaking is vital to your survival. This is not Dark Souls, running headfirst into a group of enemies is suicide. Thankfully, due to the great level design, stealth is fun and rewarding. If you manage to strike an opponent undetected, you'll instantly perform a killing blow. This makes life a lot easier. Not only can you do this to the regular enemies, but also most of the mini-bosses in the game. Enemies aren't deaf though. If you're gonna slice a guy's throat close to nearby enemies, they're going to hear it. Stealth is best accomplished by getting up somewhere high with your grappling hook or hiding in tall grass. Stealth is not overpowered though. For those of you who don't like stealth, don't worry, you'll be finding a lot more than you'll be hiding. One of the added benefits of stealth is the ability to eavesdrop on enemies. This can provide you with useful information such as alternate pathways or tips on how to beat strong opponents. Usually it'll be a conversation that'll be like, Hey, I heard it doesn't like fire. Yeah, man, I heard it doesn't like fire. It'd be a shame if someone had some sort of fire weapon. One of the main things that can help you in combat is your prosthetic arm, which can transform into different weapons that you can find out in the world. One of these weapons may be an axe that can cut through shields, or shurikens that can kill enemies from afar. These weapons are very useful during combat, but do keep in mind they take time to use and don't allow you to deflect while using them. These weapons can also be upgraded with a surprisingly in-depth customization system. The materials and money you acquire through playing the game can be spent to modify certain tools to give them different properties and movesets, all of which can be swapped around at any time. These prosthetic weapons add a good amount of depth to the combat and can be quite fun to use. Through killing enemies, you can also gain experience points which can be spent on different moves and passive abilities. The game encourages you to experiment with different moves so you can get that extra edge in a fight. One of the best skills in the game allows you to parry an unblockable thrust attack by dodging towards the enemy at exactly the right time, dealing with a lot of posture damage. Get the timing wrong and you'll dodge right into the end of the spear, becoming the world's first shinobi kebab. There is also a move where if you jump and kick an enemy when they do a devastating sweep attack, you'll also do a lot of posture damage. Combine all of this gameplay together and you have an incredibly fast and ferocious combat system. Once you do enter that state of zen while fighting a boss, when you're dodging and deflecting everything perfectly and when you finally break that posture bar and deal the killing blow, it is one of the most rewarding experiences you can feel. Now, you do have one more ability in your arsenal. There is a reason it's called Sekiro Shadows Die Twice and not just Sekiro, and that is because when you die, you can revive. You'd think a game where you can revive would make it easier. Well, guess what, it's not. 
When an enemy kills you, you can wait for a limited amount of time before you revive, so that when an enemy goes to walk away, you can come back to life and stab them in the back. You can even revive during bosses too. Reviving too much, however, does have a price. Reviving too much can give your character Dragon Rot, which will decrease your chances of not losing anything upon death. When you die in Sekiro, you'll lose half your money and some XP, making death a little more forgiving than the previous tiles. Dragon Rot can only be cured with these fairly rare items you can find. This system makes reviving more of a risk, helping apply even more pressure to the player. When you revive, you better make sure you're confident you can kill the enemy. All of these mechanics have to be put into practice if you want to succeed, and who better to test your skills than the stars of the From Software games, the bosses. Now the bosses are wonderful, they are expertly designed under the best fights in the game. They are also impossible! There isn't a single boss in this game I beat first try, not including the gimmick bosses, which is a first for me in these games. They require you to master everything you've learned, so when you do get to the last boss, you better expect it's gonna throw everything it has at you. They will test your endurance and patience, and my god, you better be patient. I was stuck on one boss for three hours trying to learn all the correct timings, and it was so much fun. Sekiro actually has the least bosses out of all the Souls games so far, but that's not included in the game's new addition, the mini-bosses. These guys are usually distinguished by their name in the top left corner and their multiple health bars. Yes, that's right, bosses and mini-bosses all have multiple health bars, meaning you have to deal multiple killing blows, so even if you do get a stealth kill on a mini-boss, it's gonna turn around and cripple you. The mini-bosses vary drastically in terms of strategy. Some even require certain items in order to kill. Most of these guys are optional though, but I still suggest killing them. They are the best practice the game gives you and they can drop some of the best items in the game. Much like Dark Souls, there will be places you'll go where you'll take two steps, aggro something huge, die and say, yep, not supposed to be here yet. So, what are these rewards you get? Well, the progression system is quite different to the Souls series. First off, Sekiro is not an RPG. There are no builds or traditional level ups, and if that's something that you don't like, understand that's not what Sekiro is trying to be. Thanks to the game not being an RPG, this has allowed From Software to streamline the difficulty a lot more. All of Sekiro's upgrades, other than the XP system, is found throughout the world. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Exploration is the most engaging thing you can do in a video game. If you get the player to go out of their way to somewhere you didn't tell them to go and they feel rewarded for it, you've got them. They're hooked. Most of Sekiro's levels are incredibly open and full of secrets. There are some prosthetic tools I never found which maybe could have helped me drastically. Some of the items you can find can buff your attack power or vitality for a short period of time, making boss fights that little bit easier. There are sections in this game where you might find an NPC who'll say, Hey, uh, I really want a, uh, golden apple. So then later on you'll find a golden apple and go, Oh shit, that's that thing that guy wanted, and then you're rewarded. It's this completely optional thing that you can miss, making that reward much sweeter. The strongest enemies tend to drop the best items, like one which increases the amount of uses on your Estus flat- I mean, I mean healing gourd. This progression system is much simpler, but still offers enough reward to keep you engaged. Now, because of the game's high difficulty, once again, the Morans have come out. Hey! Asshole! The game wasn't made for you! There is this irrational belief that games are supposed to appeal to everybody. Listen, put any walking simulator in front of me, I'll just fall asleep. I hate them. Journey made me feel nothing and it was a complete waste of time. But that doesn't mean it should change, it's just not for me. I'm glad other people enjoy them and I can see why. It's just... I fucking despise it. But Oliver, we should have an easy mode. Oh, you fucking idiot. Do you want to know the second most engaging thing you can do in a game? Challenge. A wise man once said, I'd rather a game be unrealistically hard than mind-numbingly easy. But Oliver, you could put the easy mode in and still have the hard mode. No! These games are completely designed around the difficulty. Miyazaki himself said, the whole point of these games is you're supposed to overcome the challenge. The best part of these games are the parts where you win. Listen everybody, cruel, hard fact of life. The human race is lazy. We will always take the path that requires the least effort. Have you any idea how easy it would be to just pause the game and change it to easy just to beat this one boss you're stuck on? Like what's the point in that? Have you any idea how many people who don't play difficult games love Dark Souls? It's because for once, the game is forcing you to do better. There is no help. There is nothing wrong with looking at Sekiro and saying, that game is not for me, it's too hard, I don't have the time, and I don't have the patience. That's fine. But the moment you start saying, hey, change it because I don't like it, fuck you. 
Now, for those of you who do want to take on this horrifying challenge, I do have some tips for you. Number one, don't get angry. Well, you can get angry, but just don't get frustrated, which is a different thing. Don't worry. Trust me, you'll get angry. Oh, what the fuck? Well, you can't, you can't just do that, it's making sense. Oh yeah, you can just do that move, yeah. Okay. What am I supposed to jump over that? Oh, fuck off. Oh, oh, what the fuck? Yeah, you can just get all this posture back, that makes sense. How are you supposed to die? That literally makes no sense. Technically. Yes, bullshit police. I like to report, I've just been fucked. Oh, look, back to the beginning again. Gonna do the first two phases again. The great thing about these games is due to how well they're designed, every death is your fault. Except Dark Souls 2, but we don't talk about Dark Souls 2. Do not blame the game, blame yourself. Getting frustrated will just make you worse at the game. Take a break, take your dog for a walk or something, then come back and stare at yourself in the mirror and say, Come on Oliver, get your shit together, you can do this. Number 2. There is always another way. If you run into an area that seems impossible, there is always some other path that'll make your life easier. The mini bosses will most likely have a path to them that'll allow you to stealth attack them. Number three, search everywhere. The most useful stuff in the game is always somewhere you're not supposed to go. Maybe take notes of what NPCs say or areas that you can't beat just yet. Number four, fight everything. Practice is something you absolutely need and the toughest enemies will always be the best practice. Not only this, but you can get plenty of XP, money and items. And number five, this isn't Dark Souls. Trust me, those first areas you're going to die a lot because your brain is saying, hey, I know this. If you see a big guy swinging a sword at you, you're going to instinctively want to roll, but remember there's no invincibility frames, so you'll probably get hit. Also, only run away when you need to heal. The best offense and defense in this game is deflecting and applying pressure. Not only will the enemy's posture bar go down if you run away, but also running back in to fight the enemy is incredibly dangerous. So after that's all said and done, I love this game. Like I said, it's the best game I've played in the last five years. The combat is outstanding and amazingly fun. I don't know if I like it more than Bloodborne, but it's probably better than the Dark Souls series. 9 out of 10. I know I'm a fairly new channel, but understand that to get a 9 from me is basically almost impossible. So, why didn't it get a 10? Well, to get a 10 from me might actually be impossible. In order to get a 9, your game basically has to be amazing and almost flawless. But in order to get a 10, you have to do something that completely evolves the genre. If you remember games like Half-Life and Halo, those games were outstanding. But not only that, every game after it tried to copy it because they did something brand new. They took the genre and completely evolved it. Sekiro is a phenomenal game, but it's not going to change the world. From Software, you're like the best developers in the world, and for the love of God, just make Bloodborne 2 already, please. So, that's all from me, and remember, don't give up, skeleton.